think There's a fun know. command you can run on a server. You can say uh, uptime. So we've done it before. If we go yeah, to, sure. here's one of my servers. We'll go try that and we'll say uptime on shware.org. Up 378 days without a reboot. Which when you do finally reboot it and you try to do all the updates, oh my goodness. Um, I was wondering with your YouTube videos, like the long ones, mm -hmm. how do you get past, isn't there a 10 minute limit originally? Or do there used to be a 10 minute limit for everybody except for educational groups. But then I started getting these notices like you can now upload 15 minutes. You can now upload greater than 15 minutes. And we don't know what the limit is. And I definitely have run out of steam for putting in annotations in those videos. It's not hard, it just takes like, you know, for a half hour video, it takes me three hours to annotate it. Yeah, the new editing stuff is actually really easy. You just like highlight and put a box type text to say which time range to show it and it oh. appears on top of your video. It was great when, I forget which one of you guys found a typo in the uh, first video. When I had you were able to just put it right over the... Yeah, I just put a box in there saying, no, don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, I was playing around with Blender and trying to do some of the Python and uh, like help question mark and like no that didn't work and you know, all these. Oh, so you're in a regular Python shell, right? It well, it brings you into Blender and they have their own. It's their like own shell. It's like a built-in editor. Yeah, like shell. I forget exactly what they call it. So if you look in the IPython manual, very deep down in there, there's a command you can call from anywhere if you have IPython installed in the environment, that will kick you into an IPython shell so that if you want to get oh, okay. those things, yeah. which once you start learning them and you go back to a regular Python shell, you want to beat your head on the desk. Yeah. I've tried to hit question yeah, marks IPython, sometimes. Okay. Like you probably got something that looked like, if I just, we just say Python. And if I type like LS, it says what? Mm -hmm. If we say print question mark, it yeah, says yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. I tried to print. No yeah, so you're facing a regular Python shell uh -huh. that doesn't have all those handy features. Oh, okay. But it is kind so of non. Python kind of helps you with your, your, it makes it easier to interact with the. Yeah, it's really meant for replacing like the type in real time world. You can uh -huh. use it for your actual code, but not many people do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like there's some really neat commands. Like you can store up variables so that when you start up IPython shell, it's got your variables right there. And so if like hideous file name pass, like I'll work with a couple different files on my disk that are all over the place. And if you're trying to type those every time. Yeah. Yuck. So you just put them in, say store the variable name, and then when you start up IPython, they're right there. You guys ready to get going for lecture number 20? Because of our brownout, I've been trying to, to get better each time at logging. And last time we just did log start. I'd like you guys to give a try at doing the full up. If you do a log start with a couple different options, those will log more information. So I'll give you a quick, I'll load this up here so you can see it. So if we do log start question mark, and if I hit this, we're gonna get help. Up here, there's the three options, dash O, dash R, and dash T. You should go ahead and give them all a go. If I hit space to go page down, so dash O also logs what IPython prints out when you run all of your commands. Sometimes, like I've been looking back at the logs and I see a command and I have to go rerun it in order to figure out what it's going to do. So having the dash O in there, it's great until you do what I did with the locals last time when it printed out tens of thousands of pages of junk. It will then write all that to disk, which is no fun. So we'll try and be more careful with uh, printing out stuff. Dash R. So if you've looked in your log files and you see the magic, it'll say like IP magic and things like that, this will remove that. So it's gonna store exactly what you typed, which I think is better because having your log file contain changed stuff, like if we do a history, you'll see, like go ahead in your shells type history. So you'll see it such that it says underscore IP magic dot uh, magic and then history. It's really not, terribly friendly and you typed history, not the craziness that you see. So dash R will make sure that you log what you typed. Dash T isn't terribly important, but it's a timestamp. So if you want to see how long it takes you to do stuff, you can just put dash T in there. And there's special commands too that we can also run later on that will actually time how long it takes to do operations. But dash T, it's just kind of nice to see how you're going time-wise. And if you see the timestamp between two commands be like five minutes, that meant you either took a coffee break or you, you thought a lot or both. So if we have that log file, uh, we can do a less just to make sure it looks okay. 
So we'll do bang to run a shell command, less. And then uh, tab was a very bad idea. I'm going to do ls. So I'll do bang less log dash class. And I apologize. I've been hitting tab at some very unfortunate times. Yell at me if I do it too much. I'm driving you crazy. So if we do less of your log file, we have a timestamp followed by a command that we typed exactly as we typed it and then a timestamp and the output will be there hopefully ls doesn't look like it has the output so i may have messed up if we do history i did do a log start with dash o i'm not quite sure if we do a print hello world let's see if we get some output and we don't what if i think that's standard out so if we do one plus one Pardon me while I figure this out in front of you guys. So if it's actually return, sending data to a standard out, if it's printing things, you're not going to save it in your log file. But any function that you call that returns stuff and it gets stored into the out array will get stored into your log here. I didn't catch that before, so now I have a sense of, of how that works. And if your machines brown out again and reboot, hopefully we won't have as much lost. And hopefully the power will be good and nobody will back in telephone poles. So that gets us going with the safety aspect of the class. It's always co good to code safely. And let's go ahead and grab the bag file from last time. So in my notes here, this is just getting the org file and getting it opened up. This is a way to do it from within IPython. I think most of you already have the org file up. So we'll go down to this line and grab that. So I'll do a control space and then control E to go to the end of the line. You can just highlight and do edit copy, edit paste. Make sure you catch that exclamation point at the beginning, which I missed in my copy. Hit enter and download that bag file and uncompress it. So do bang B unzip two, H1 tab, press enter. And we should be back to the world that we had before. So we've got three files in here. We've got our bag file and we're going to jump through what we did before. We're not going to do any loading of the elevation. We're just going to work with the metadata today. So we're going to cruise through what we did last time with metadata, getting things loaded up. Now, if you're having trouble with reading your LS, you might want to make your screen, your terminal a little bit wider. So grab the edge of your terminal and drag it to be fairly wide and then rerun your LS. And just so you guys see, I'm going to do a PWD so you see where I'm at. Um, I'm in a separate class 20 directory, so I've got everything packaged together. Let's go ahead and start loading up our modules. And I use control L a lot in Emacs to recenter things. And so wherever your cursor is becomes the center of the screen when you type control L so that we can see both the instructions and the notes. So the first thing we need is import h5pi. That's our HDF5 reader since bags are HDF5 format. Then we'll also do import numpy. I don't think I need it, but might as well import it from matplotlib import pyplot for plotting, if we end up doing some plotting. And then our XML module from XML import eTree, the element tree interface for reading XML. Let's go ahead and open up a bag file. So bag equals h pi dot file parentheses single quote h11 tab go ahead and open up the bag file and we'll see if i have any cut and paste errors for those who are uh, making sure to get it right that way so if you get a really strange error again this time i may have missed another single quote or something let's go ahead and type who's just to see what's in our environment we'll be doing that a lot today I'm getting more and more addicted to the who's command as I work through it and use it more. I hadn't used it before this class and now I'm com definitely hooked. Go ahead and use our bag and rip out the metadata just like we did before. So if you are, aren't following this, it's also in the last class notes. How we'll get that is bag sub bag root metadata. So metadata txt equals, do you guys remember the join command for strings? We joined some fields together with commas to create comma separated values a while back. Did that just add straight to the end of whatever it was? Yeah, so it takes that 
string that's in the quotes and it takes each of the elements and joins them together with that string in between them. It's kind of opposite the sense of all other string commands. So if you're feeling like join feels weird, yeah, it should. So we're going to try metadata underscore text equals two single quotes, period, join, left parenthesis, bag, and square brackets, and then our path to the data. We're going to hit enter, see what happens. We type whose, and it looks like it works without the values. OK. So now that we have metadata, we can say metadata text and we can do a array slice and just grab off the first 50 characters and see what it looks like. And we now have some XML data in there. And let's save this to a file so we can work with it over in Emacs and take a peek. So we'll do out equals open. I wrote file in the notes. That's the old style. It's the same as open in Python 2. If when you go to Python 3, file disappears and you only get open. So H. And I'm going to hit tab, but make sure you don't hit enter. Make sure you back up and type XML for your extension and change your file name. Otherwise, you'll be overwriting your bag data file that you want to have around for this lecture. And then add a comma and then a W string. And that says, please make this file handle writable. So we're going to write to this file. And if we hit Enter, we now have a file that we can write to. So we can say out.write. And then we can just pass it our metadata text, hit Enter, and then out.close to make sure that you write it. Now, with files, there's a thing called buffering going on. So if you go and you look at that file right now, it hasn't finished writing that all to disk. It's probably left out the last thousand or so bytes. It tries to group things together and write them all at once to go fast. So it may not have flushed that all to disk. And if you say close, it will then finish up and make sure everything is written to the disk. So hit Enter. And why don't we go ahead and quick open that file up over here in Emacs. So you can do Control-X, Control-F. Hit Enter. You'll see the directory edit mode. And you should see your XML file and hit Enter on it. So I just like to have that around so that I can refer to it easily. And if you're in a directory with too many files, you can always, I'm going to do a control X B. So if you've got a ton of stuff here, you can do a control S to search and type period XML, and it will take you to the XML files and you can hit control S again. Are you getting stuck finding the file? You've done everything in your home directory, which is okay. Just type control S and then a period XML. And see how it took you right to it there? So just hit enter or click on it. So we don't really need it, but it's good just to take a quick peek again at the file. So we're going to be parsing this really quick and grabbing out the fields that we need. Keep an eye on the geographic bounding box. We're going to use that today to plot where our data is on the globe. So hopefully today we'll get to see some global maps. Go up to the top, so do a meta less than, do a control S and just type longitude. And it will then show you the longitude. So they go and get highlighted so you'll see them down a little ways. So that's control S and then longitude, all lowercase. If you're not seeing it, don't worry. I'm used to reading lots of angle brackets. I do it way too often. It gets easier with time. Control G to bail out of your search. If you're not seeing it, just hit control G and make your Org mode notes take over your screen and just hide that. So I'm going to go back to buffers and go back to my org mode notes. Last time when I type locals, bad things happen. So I'm going to go ahead and clean up my workspace a little bit. If I go over here and I type who's, I can say delete out. We don't need that variable. And we can delete, so DEL, and then bag, hit enter. Now if we type who's, we're going to see fewer things in our workspace. They're gone. So if we type locals, we shouldn't get enormous amounts of junk coming across our screen. It may still be a lot, but not horrible. All right, so let's go ahead and pull out our root, our title, abstract, and then our bounding box. If we say root equals etree, this is how you load up data into um, an element tree. So this one, you don't need to really learn. You just need to copy and paste it from someplace in your notes when you need to do it, which is what I do. Run this command, root equals etree.fromString, 
left parenthesis metadata text, right parenthesis dot get root tree, and then two parentheses. That will then create our tree of nodes that represents our XML file. And then we're going to use a search into that tree to find our title. So title equals root dot xpath, single quote. Now two slashes in the xpath syntax means the top of the tree. Star means search anywhere in there. And then title. And so last time we found out this returned a list of nodes where if there were multiple titles, say, in your document, it's going to return all of them. We only want the first one. So we'll do zero. And then we want to get the text in between those two tags. So if you remember in XML, we're going to see in the file somewhere title, and then you've got some text, and then the end, which is the slash going which way, I think it's this way, title. So it's going to go find that text for us, which is hiding somewhere deep in there. And if we hit enter and we type title, we now see our less than fun bag title, which is bag file created from a very long path and if you notice, these slashes are the opposite direction of the slashes we've been using in Linux. This is a pretty good evidence between that and the end colon that this was written on a Windows computer. So their file system uses the other slash to represent directories. And since that slash leaning to the left is special, there's two slashes for each one. And now we have our less than fun title. Let's grab our abstract. So abstract equals root.xpath, and we're going to search for abstract. And we'll grab the first one, text, hit enter, and let's check out our abstract. So let's say print abstract. Go ahead and hit enter. So here it says we've got some project, here's a survey number, it's in Alaska, Chapman Strait, sub-locality, north and south arm of Hood Bay. Not too bad. It uh, gives you a pretty good sense of what's going on. And let's go grab our bounding box. So our xmin is going to be our left-hand side of our longitude. So we'll say xmin equals, and now we want this to be turned from a string, which is going to come back from the search into a floating point number. So float. Then we can do the same search. So root.xpath. Start from the top. Look for, and I'm going to just read it off here because it's long and crazy. West bound longitude and we'll see how many spelling errors I can make longitude and hopefully dot text and then I have to make sure to finish that parentheses that goes with the float over here and if you hit enter we should have xmin minus 134.49 I know XML probably doesn't feel very friendly to you right now with these weird xpath things and lots of angle brackets but imagine trying to search through a text document to, to figure out how to get latitude and longitude bounding boxes out of some report. If you get used to XML and XPath, you can reach into reports like this and grab out key data. And hopefully you'll be able to start being able to take that data and make it do for you what it's supposed to do, which is actually provide you things like the bounding box and the title. So now let's go grab the XMAX. So I'm just going to, you can copy paste or you can follow along the way I'll do it where I just hit the up arrow to go to the last command that was close. Control A takes you to the beginning of the line. X max. And then it's instead of being west, this is going to be, the maximum is going to be the east bounding longitude. I'm going to hit enter. And now I need to do the same for the y's, but it's going to be latitude. So I start off with that same command by hitting the up arrows. And I replace that to a control A to get the beginning, control D to delete a character, Y min, and then I'll go replace instead of west bounding longitude. And by the way, a lot of Emacs commands work here. So I can hit the escape key and then press D and that will delete a word all at once with one keystroke. So if you've got long words inside of your or groups of characters in your commands, you can quickly delete them. So now I need to replace that with south bound latitude. Hit enter and hopefully there's no errors and no typos. Okay. And now I'm going to do control A, Y max. Go over here and replace south with north and I'll get the maximum Y. 
I think it looks pretty good. You could type print on all of these or just type in X max, Y min, Y max, but we can use whose again, which is getting a little long. It's easy to see right here, but we can also do with whose, it'll do some searches for you. So if we just wanna get all of the floating point variables in our environment back, we can say whose float, and it will return just the floating point numbers in our workspace. So it's not a very powerful search. There's a, there's a better search function that's elsewhere in this tool. But being able to just ask for everything of the same type all at once is kind of nice, especially as you get in an hour or two into a project. Say you want to get all the strings in your environment, you could say who's str, and it would then return all the strings that we have. So our abstract, our whole metadata text, and our title. So it's a nice way just to be able to pull apart what you've got in your working variables. So now we have everything that we need to be able to go and create a KML file and view it in Google Earth. We have a title, some abstract text to put in the description of a little pop-up. We've also got our Xmin, Ymin, uh, Xmax, Ymax, which is our bounding box around an area. So we, we can now aim to draw a box on the globe to see where our data is because Staring at text all day like this will drive you nuts. And if you're working with thousands of files, trying to find the right one in the right area, if you can't plot it on a map, it just sucks. I mean, I don't even remember the, uh, I roughly remember our latitude longitude here, but I'm not, if you asked me it, I would definitely be off by a degree or two. So let's go ahead and create a KML and view it in Google Earth. Now we're gonna use our format stuff. So let's run back through that because format, it was a lot pretty quick. With strings, if you remember, I tried to find some great documentation on this stuff and I didn't like anything I found. So I apologize, I'll keep looking. So let's try some examples again using our, so if we type who's float, using our x min, x max, let's just work with it a little bit and give it a go. So what we can do is create a string and inside there we can use braces and a variable name to write out our variables in any order we want. So we can say xmin, and then you run the dot .format method on your string, and it's gonna do that template replacement. And then you have to tell it the variables you want. So xmin is gonna be set to our local xmin, hit enter. And so you get back our number in a string. That's pretty boring in this case. But now we can then do, so I hit the up arrow to get the old command and we'll edit that and say and Ymax. Now if I hit enter, it's gonna be upset because I haven't told it the value of Ymax. So I need to go do that. Ymax equals Ymax. Hit enter. And so now it's replacing each of those variables in the right place. I'll throw in an example that isn't in the notes. The order on the right doesn't matter. So we could say Ymax equals Ymax like that. And we still get the same exact string a lot of the other ways that people do strings with, like for, if you've seen a percent %d to write out a decimal or percent %f to write out a float, you have to have the order exactly right of your variables that come after your string and you'll go a little crazy. So it'll look something like this. Someone might have like percent %s, you know, hello, percent %d, percent %f in a string. And you have to know that this thing is gonna be your first string of your first variable, this decimal is gonna be your second variable, and this float will be your third variable, and then you do this little percent, and then you'll say hi is your first string, and 42 is your number, and then 1.25 is your floating point number. And you have to know each of these positions map into the first, the second, and the third, which is fine in this case, there's only a couple, but you'll see when we write the KML, we're gonna have lots of lines and we're gonna be putting in six different things all over the place. So if you're trying to go through and you have a bug, it might take quite a while to figure out which one's in the wrong place and it just gets tiring. And if someone else gives you code and has got this stuff, it takes a lot of work to read and it's just, it gets frustrating. I'll do the example from last time showing you a different variable. So the variable name inside here doesn't have to match the outside variable. So if we say wahoo.format, and we can say wahoo equals and ymax. As long as they're matched up between the left-hand side here 
and what's inside, it should work. So if I hit enter, hopefully it works. It prints out the 57.4, which is our Ymax. So if we say whose floats, we see that our Ymax is indeed 57.4. So let's create a little dictionary of our bounding box that we can work with. I'll go ahead and type it. If you get frustrated with typing, you can copy and paste this from the notes. So B box or bounding box, which is just short. Remember the curly braces create a dictionary. I tend to, when I write long things like this, I tend to create the closing braces, whether they're curly braces or parentheses or square brackets ahead of time and then fill them in. I just tend to make less typos that way. So we'll say single quote x-min for our first key, and that's going to be set to our x-min value. y-min, set that to be our y-min value. And x-max, set that to be our x-max value. And spaces don't really matter. And then y-max string, set that to be y-max. And I'm going to hit enter and hopefully I haven't typoed. Okay, good. So if we type b-box by itself, hit enter, it's going to print it out for you. And you'll see that it's gone and replaced the variables up here. That we, so we've had x min got replaced with the number down here. And the order didn't really matter. It's just lookup keys. So then we can say b box x min and get back our minimum x. So it'd be nice to be able to use that with your format. So if you had a format that you wanted to insert your bounding box into, some template string, it'd be nice to be able to just say, let's pass in the bounding box as one, one word saying B box, as opposed to typing out something like, you know, if we go up here and we type this out every single time with this format, that's okay for one or two, but we don't want to type them all. So what we can do is we can say, if we try, We'll just make a test. We'll say x min. So for x min and y max in parentheses around each of our variables. And if we say dot format and we just pass it that dictionary, it would be really awesome if this actually worked. And if we hit enter, it very much does not work. Uh, kind of a bummer because that syntax to me would be really awesome. And Python tries to be the language of least surprise. And some other languages that I work with are maybe the language of most surprise. C is a, one of those where you get yourself bit by strange things some days. But there is a way to do that. We can actually go up and replace that with star star in front of the bounding box variable. And what that does is it expands that dictionary, the keys and the values, into the arguments of that function. So if you hit enter here, it's going to go and expand out everything that's in the bounding box is all the arguments to that function. And it then magically works. Now, the nicer thing about this is I tried to show you guys local at the end of the last class and I had too much stuff in there. So it got really gross very fast. I'm going to get brave. I'm going to try and type locals. Now, if you hit question mark, we'll get some help on it first. It's going to update and create a dictionary that's got everything in the local, the current scope. So scope is a word that means sort of like which function or class am I in? Where am I right now when I'm executing code? So if we type locals, I'm going to not do that first. I'm going to type a who just to see what we've got. Okay, who's. I am not going to do that right away. I'm going to delete the metadata text because I know that's a lot of text and it's going to make a mess. So I'll hit enter. So who's again. So we've deleted our metadata text so that we don't get too much junk on the screen. And now we'll type locals and see what happens. Don't hit return until you know it worked for me. Okay, it's not too terrible. And it's actually done some funny things where it actually has some of the stuff that IPython has. So it's a little bit more than you would normally get in a program because IPython is storing a lot of local variables. But inside of here, it's actually got xmax, ymin, all that, that good stuff. So what we can do, we didn't have to create that bounding box variable. So we didn't need to create a b box. We could just type locals. I'll put some spaces in here so it's easier to read. And this should, if you've created a whole bunch of variables in your working space, you can just create a big template, call star star locals parentheses, and all of those are available to your template. 
Now this syntax might feel really weird and awkward, and I see some great expressions that, that show that this is uncomfortable and weird. If you learn this idiom, and we're going to use it to create our KML, you can reach into your workspace and grab anything that's available with whose, and stuff that into your file that you're trying to write. And so we'll do that with a KML, and hopefully you'll see the power of this, that you could say make a template that's your ISO metadata, which writing out the full ISO metadata just looks miserable. I mean, it's a big file with lots of nodes and confusing. So the idea here is you create templates. In those files, you put curly braces around a name that you want to replace in there, and you can magically fill in the parts that you want to have filled out. So when you get to Summer Hydro and you're writing your metadata for every single multibeam file, remember this. The people who did it before by hand suffered for no reason, and I, I don't want you guys to suffer. So let's give it a go. And do I have any more examples before I go on? We can skip all the other little funny examples. OK, let's be lazy. Go into our org mode file. Hopefully, this shows up in the HTML version if you're using that. And what we'll do is we'll copy. So control space right at the beginning of this very first XML less than. In this section, we're going to grab all that KML text. So I'm grabbing, see if I can make it fit nicely here. I'm going to grab from this less than, right after the begin source, right to after the slash KML. So this is a little block of XML, and it's a specific kind of XML called KML, or Keyhole Markup Language. And this is a document that specifies how to draw geometry on Google Earth. And so we're going to create a place mark. It's going to have a name, and we're going to fill in file name which I don't think we have set yet, which is not good. So we'll have to set that. Uh, title and abstract are going to go in the description. And the reason I did file name is because our title is kind of kooky. It's this very long path on someone else's computer at some other office at probably NOAA. Um, we'll put in the title and abstract in the description to go with this. And then we're going to create what's called a line string. In the, in the KML world, a line string is just a line. Why it's called string on there, they could have just written line, and I would have been happier, but that's OK. And then coordinates, and in KML, with a line string, you just write each coordinate on a separate line. So we have to say our x min, y min, starting at the bottom left, and we'll go around and we have to say the same coordinate. So I'll draw that out real quick just so you see it. If we have our coordinates, our bounding box looks something like this, and we have a coordinate at each point. This coordinate right here is at x min, comma, y min with my overly exaggerated y there. And then this is x min, and then this is y what? All right, yep. And you know, it's one of those things that's not very hard, but if you try and do it without drawing it out, I bet you a good number of people would make a mistake. I certainly do. So then x max, y max, and then x max, y min. And you would think that it would know how to close this, but this is just a line. It's not a polygon, so you have to say, OK, start here, do this one, do this one, do this one, do this one, and come back and do this one again to make it look closed. Because we just want to draw a line that looks like a closed box on the Earth. So copy that, meta w. And now we're going to open up a file. I called it uh, bboxtemplate.kml. So we'll do control x, control f, bbox-template.kml. So remember, bbox stands for bounding box. You'll find that computer scientists love to abbreviate everything and anything they can get their hands on. Hit enter, and then control Y to paste. So here I've pasted that in. We're going to reach back into our Emacs knowledge, and we'll do a control X, control S to save, or you can do file save. And what we want to do next is meta X revert buffer. Meta X revert dash buffer. And then you're going to type Yes. What this is going to do is reload that file off of disk. Revert dash buffer. If I do this, hopefully it's going to reload that file and it's going to recognize that it's an XML file and it's going to tell us if it's valid or not. So press enter. Now it's going to ask me yes or no. I type yes because I really, really want to see it looking nice. And if you look down here, the mode change to NXML, there's a little valid here. If yours says invalid, wave your hand around. I'll come see what character you missed. Control G. Do meta x revert buffer. Press enter. 
typed yes. Yeah. Press enter. Let's see, if we go up to the beginning of yours, there is a space right there. So save that and do another revert buffer. So if you have any extra space, if you put a space in there, one or more spaces, it's going to break. So that has to be right up against the left-hand column. So if you're not seeing it, I bet that is your problem. That's looking pretty good. So you did a meta, so you saved it. So control X, control S. And then do the revert buffer that's on the whiteboard. So here we're in your template. We can do a control X, control W, write somewhere else. I'm going to just back up so it's tilde slash, and we're going to write in your home directory. It's a little messy, but it'll work. Hit enter. Now it's in your home directory. So you tried to put it in class 20, but you hadn't created the directory yet. Chicken and the egg. So let's now use this template. So we haven't really explained what KML is, but by using a template like this, we can fill in those variables, hopefully, and create something that we can load up and see on a globe. Sort of a hello world in Google Earth. So I need to save mine since I've fiddled with it. The nice thing about Python is when you want to load up data, we could just say open bbox template read to parentheses, left parentheses, right parentheses. We could just say print. And this is going to read our template in into a variable and, hit, and just print it. Well, actually, it's never going to make it to a variable. So if I hit enter, and now we have our nice template. So what we can do is we can actually save that into a variable. So we're going to go ahead and save it into KML template. Open read. OK, so if you didn't do the print, then it's going to show you the slash ends as uh, the new lines as slash ends. So what you had, yeah, I threw that in. I left it out at first. So you, you did this, which is you hit enter, and you'll see it come out like them like that. So it looks a little better with the print in front. So let's save that in KML template. Template equals open bbox template read. So read, we've done so basically kind of a read line thing before where it reads one line at a time. The read command will just read the whole file in and give it back to you all at once. I would recommend not doing that on really huge files. If you call a read on a gigabyte file, it's going to read a gigabyte of data into memory and get really slow. So hit enter. We also need, if we look at our template over here, we have a file name that we wanted to use instead of our kind of overly long title. So let's set a variable, file name equals h1, press tab. It's going to show us the bag and the XML that we have. We'll just call it bag. Press enter. So that's our file name saved. We can now use that. And now the magic of dot format is we can pass in all those local variables. So if we type whose, you'll see we now have, hiding somewhere in here, file name, abstract, our title should be somewhere right down here, and our bounding box coordinates are right there. So if we look at this guy, I think we have every one of our variable names in parentheses, or sorry, in curly braces in there okay. This is where we see if we can do it and everything works. We can try to do that. So we can say print. So we just see it to the screen. KML underscore press tab. So that'll that's our template dot format. And then the star star locals to grab everything out of our local working space. If I've done this right, this is going to print to our screen of what would be a working KML. We don't want it to the screen in the end. We want it to a file, but this is a good check. Uh, with an S. Thank you. Thank you very much for catching that. So if you see here, it's now printed it out. So we have our overall KML. And if we look at our pieces, so our first one was file name right here. So if we look at our name, it's filled out to be our bag. The title, was an abstract came in inside of the description. So here's our title, our really ugly title. And here's our abstract coming right after that. And our coordinates are hopefully where our bag is located on the Earth. And we have what we can use to view in Google Earth. So now let's try and save it to a file. So we'll go ahead. Now, in the notes, I'm saving it to, your, to my Dropbox. We can try to save it locally. We'll try that first. But Google Earth likes to crash a lot in a virtual machine. It doesn't really, the graphics on the virtual machine aren't very good. 
So we'll give it a go. If your virtual machine crashes, follow the notes and save it into your Dropbox, and then you can download it on the Windows side and view your, the KML. So we'll just save it locally. So we'll say out, and this will be different than the notes, and we'll say h1 press tab. We'll place that with KML. And I'm also going to add a dash B box. So I've changed this part to be different than our files. I tend to like to name mine, if it's a bounding box KML that's just showing a bounding box, I tend to have a dash B box. That's just my particular style so I can realize that it's not going to look like a bunch of bathymetry. Single quote, close that up, but we uh, need to make that a right. And does anybody see my really big bug? This isn't going to open up a file unless I put open in the front. So there was my big bug. So hopefully this will open a nice file. Hit enter. Now we can say out.write. And we can go grab our nice template printing section. Put copy. Don't copy the print. Edit. Paste. And now is when you risk running into too many or too few parentheses. So I've got three over here. So we've got one on the left, two on the left, three on the left, and three on the right. So you get good at counting parentheses when you program this way. If I hit enter, and then out.close, I should have a KML file on my disk. So that no, was that right here, number 74 up there. Yeah, once you oh, see it, it oh, looks pretty it easy. Yeah. Here, when I said I had a bug, yeah. you kept my bug and didn't, didn't keep up. I was going kind of fast. So hit the up arrow and go back to your out command. Keep going. Out equals, one more. So if you look up there, well, it's kind of off the screen. It's right before that left parenthesis should be an open. So type open, press enter. Now rerun your, your right command. So hit the up arrow until you see your out dot right. Press enter. That looks good. And now you need your out.close. So I'm going to type history so you all can see it if you're still stuck. And so we are working right in here. So we're in 74 through 77. A very common bug that I just saw someone do that I do a lot is you forget those parentheses. So if you say out.close, it says built-in built -in method. This typically means you've meant, like if you thought you were going to get a number back, like if we type x min, like that, if this is a variable, it'll print out the value. But if it's a function, you'll see this. And it's a great sign that you need parentheses after the end. I do it all the time. You guys ready to try Google Earth? I'm just going to hit a new terminal. In the, print yeah. commands to listen. So if, I did if you look at my history, mm -hmm. number 72, we didn't have oh, a file name. Awesome. And it's the file name in the notes. Yeah, the file name's in the notes, but you were going pretty quick there. I have a new terminal. In that terminal, I'm going to type Google dash Earth, press enter. And I bet you that half the computers in here will have Google Earth crash, and we're not going to worry about it too much. Would you like to switch to DirectX mode? No. So you'll click no on the right. Uh, I crashed too. Awesome. <laughs> so what we can do is copy that file to our drop boxes. So I'm going to CD in that window into class 20. And I'm going to copy. So if I do an ls dash l ls-l. So I've got my KML right here. We're going to copy that file into Dropbox. So cp h11, press tab, dash, and then hit tab, and it will finish out the bbox KML. And tilde slash Dropbox. And we'll see how many of you still have a working Dropbox setup. And press Enter. I've already done this, testing this out, so I have to re overwrite it. You should just, it should just work without the yes, no. Go into your Dropbox account on the Windows side. So this is the, one of the few times we're going to use Windows in here. Open up Windows, go to Firefox. Now, I don't have Windows on my machine, so it's not going to look at all like that. And if you go into Dropbox account, you should be able to download this file onto your desktop. Leave the virtual machine behind. Open up Firefox or Explorer. Yeah, because you're running Google Earth right down here. And so you have a working Google Earth. Your password should be in KeePass X. Oh boy. That, the two things you have to know are your Dropbox password and your KeePass X password. So. 
<laughs> those should be tattooed inside your brain. So you can kill Google Earth, file quit. So I'm going to do, have to do it differently since I'm on a Mac here and I don't have a copy of Windows. I'm going to have to go to a terminal, which isn't going to show up in the screen captures. Open H11. You're going to have to go into your Dropbox and download that file and then put it on your desktop and then double click it and Google Earth should start. We'll see if it starts on my, my machine. When you get a tip, you can close it. So right now, I'm going to jump back to my virtual machine. And what you should be doing is in a regular terminal, see this line right here? That's what you need to do. So go into where, so for you, that's your home directory. Don't go into the, if you're in the class 20, just CD into class 20 and then copy your KML file into tilde slash Dropbox with a capital D. Dropbox will take over, automatically synchronize that file up to the cloud. Then you'll switch over to Windows, and from Windows you're going to download that file from Firefox or Explorer when you log into Dropbox's web service. And you can download that to your desktop and then grab it. We don't currently have directory sharing working between the virtual machine and... So on the top right of the Dropbox web page, so you, if you want, can just do file and then there should be under file, open. And if you navigate to where your KML is, which should be in research tools, and then class, and then open. So we have one person successful. Yay. Oh, there's another one. Save that file to your desktop. So download file, and then on your desktop. And you can probably just double click it right there and it would just open. So you just drag it from the download folder and it goes right that's very neat. <laughs> so hopefully, if you double click it, Google Earth should start. If it doesn't, and on the Windows firewall, you can, uh, you can just hit cancel and then close. What we have now on this screen is a bounding box somewhere that I've never been in Alaska. The nice thing about Google Earth is you don't have to worry about background data. You've just, boom, got a local area behind it so you get a sense of what's going on and you now know where that survey was supposedly located. Now just because the metadata says it doesn't mean it's always true. Be wary of that though. There are a few cases where the metadata got messed up and the bounding box was not where data was collected but it generally is pretty good and it will be getting better. So that's it for Google Earth on this lecture. We've got a few more minutes now that you've successfully gotten through Google Earth we're going to switch over and use a shoreline of our choosing. So with Google Earth, we, we can't control the background very well. We could wrap the whole Earth, but we're going to use QGIS and we're going to pick our own shoreline that we want to have in there. And we'll use the GSHHS shoreline, which is the one that the GMT folks use. And I think they may even create it. And I wrote down in here what GSHHS stands for because I can never remember it. So it says global, self-consistent, hierarchical, high-resolution shoreline. So let's close up Google Earth. You can click don't save, or you can save it if you really want to. It doesn't really matter. We now need to go in our terminal. I'll walk you guys through the notes here. So I'm going to kill my KML, so control X, K to kill that buffer. We don't really need it anymore. And we're going to scroll down a little bit in our org mode file to the section that says viewing in QGIS. We can actually right away get in QGIS and see our data. So we'll say, if you go up to applications in your Ubuntu, so we were in Windows, now switch back to uh, your, your Ubuntu virtual machine, go under science, select quantum GIS, which is also known as QGIS, fire it up. So I think we have an old, pretty old version, 1.4, but it still gets the job done. We can go under layer and we can say add vector layer. It knows about some KMLs. It doesn't know all of them, but it knows a good bit. The key thing to do is to try it. And if it fails, well, then it didn't do it. So I hit add vector layer. We're going to say browse and we're going to go into class 20 and we're not going to see anything like we had before. It could be in your Dropbox if you did that, or it could also be the other problem you, you might hit is that if it just says like OGR Esri shapefiles down here, 
or as they want me to say, ESRI, you want to go down to the bottom of this and select all files so that you can see all files. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. Now I can see all of my files and I want a KML. So I'm going to pick that one, which is the one that we just viewed through a different tool. Click open. Now we get to click open again because we like clicking open. You have now drawn a box on the screen. Congratulations. <laughs> This is why Google Earth is so fantastic, among other reasons, is that having that background right there, start with, I mean, you see this, this square, it could be a square anywhere on the Earth. It really doesn't help you very much. So we do have to load in some other data. And it doesn't come with any extra data. So that's why having the global shoreline data set handy is really nice, because then you have at least some view. If you're out in the open ocean, you know, Central Pacific, Central Atlantic, that global shoreline is not very helpful. But a lot of what you guys do is coastal mapping. And if you're in coastal mapping, there's usually a shoreline somewhere nearby. And usually that's pretty distinctive. We're gonna go grab that data set and get started on loading it into QGIS. So I'm gonna hide QGIS by clicking the little dash next to the X. So it's now down in my little toolbar. The traditional way to do it was to load the raw GS HHS of so those two links. There's actually a paper here and there's a wget to get the zip. Notice that I've got a pound in front of it. We're not going to use that one. We're going to go use a shape file. Under this, there's a section called Global Shorelines GSHHS Shape File. We're going to go grab a shape file. This is where I got the shape file from, but it comes with multiple different versions of resolution. And I just wanted you guys to deal with one, so I extracted just one of them so we don't have to download so much because it's. I think it's like a 200 megabyte file. It's pretty big. Use this wget command down here. There's wget vislab ccom blah blah blah. Copy that into not the ipython terminal. I'm going to hide that one, make it go away. Just our regular terminal here. I'm going to do edit copy. Go back over here, edit paste, and that will download the file. So now we have a tar bz2. Now with TARS, we don't have to worry about VZ2 and GZ compression. TAR will automatically handle it for us. So I've got two sample TARS that we can do. First, I like to list what's in a TAR before I unpack it because I have found TARS with really bad, horrible, messy stuff in there that you, when you unpack them, you spend a lot of time trying to undo the craziness. So TAR TF means list a file, GSHHS dash and then tab and this will list what's in our tar so it's going to create a directory and we're, we're at version 2.2.0 and this little h in here means high resolution there's i think five levels of resolution from l for low all the way up to f for full they're not in any particular order so they just stand for a word like medium or full or high so let's go ahead and unpack that so tar xf and it will take a little bit as it writes a bunch of data to your disk. And let's go ahead and look in there. So we'll CD into that directory. I'm going to be the broken record. We'll do file star and we'll see what it returns back to us. And it turns out file knows a little bit about shapefiles. So if we look here, SHP SHX returns that they're shapefiles, Esri shapefiles. We have some DBF stuff running around. And what we have is some pretty confusing stuff. So if you figure this all out, that'll be great. Let me know when you know what it is. But we're going to use a tool that knows about it. So we've used, from GDAL, we've used OGR info. And we can say gshsl1.shp. So you have to know that a shapefile tends to come as a whole bunch of files. You have to have them all. It's kind of a messy format. But when you talk about a shapefile and you tell some, some code to open a shapefile, you specify the .shp. Do an OGR info of our L1 file. So gshhs underscore h underscore L1 dot shp. Press enter if you're brave. It tells us that there's a polygon. That's not very exciting. But let's open it up in QGIS and hopefully we'll see a picture of the globe. So I've got QGIS over here. 
So we've got our bounding box up there. We'll go back to layer, add vector layer, browse. And now we have our GSHHS shapefile directory. We'll go into that, double click it. If you're feeling uncomfortable with these many ones, we can select OGR as reshape files and it will just show us those. So again, that was selecting this bottom right file type and then you select OGR as reshape files and then pick over here. It's telling you the file size. So I would bet that if we sort by file size, you'll see that number one is the biggest. And so it probably has the most information in it. I haven't really looked at them too much. Select the first one and click open and then open again and then watch your computer work. We now have, uh, everybody has a different color because color seems to be random. We have our bounding box peeking through in the corner here. So order matters. It's kind of like if you've used Illustrator or Inkscape or GIMP, it's a layered tool and whatever's on top in your layer tool will draw last and on top. So we can drag our layer up above. So I just grabbed it, drag it up above and then let go. And hopefully our bounding box line is on top and my color scheme is horrible. So properties, and then you can pick a different color in here. So pick the colors. So now you've got a shape file being drawn for your shoreline and we've got our bounding box KML and we can click the zoom out tool up here on the top right, the minus underneath the magnifying glass, click and you'll zoom out and click and you'll zoom out and you now can start seeing the area where you're in. We haven't done anything too fancy with shape files yet, but you can at least view them and see what's in there and you have a sense of where your data is at and what's going on. Now a bounding box doesn't tell you too much about the data that's in there. If you remember right from before, 90% of the data in this bounding box is empty. So really what we'd like is maybe a polygon that delimits the particular blotches of uh, bathymetry. That'd be better, but the metadata is only going to give you the bounding box. So now you've used QGIS and Google Earth to plot a bounding box of a bag and you rip that right out of the HDF5. So now when someone has you write a bag with Keras or some other tool like Flater Mouse or Hypack, you can load that HDF5 bag into Python, pull that data out, and make sure that that metadata says what you think it should say. So you now have the tools to validate uh, the software that the vendors are providing for you that you're buying. And that way, when something's not right, you can provide a bug report back to the vendor that's a lot more explicit about hey, listen, you know, you're not writing the metadata right and here's what I'm seeing in the file. That's a great way to speed up the process of getting good software. For today, that's it. Uh, we had only two people made it through the Google Earth without crashing, but that's okay, it's kind of expected. And hopefully VMware will improve their software and the graphics support so that some year Google Earth will run happily inside of a virtual machine.